Hello everyone, it's Shane Kanto, your Wasteland reviewer. Welcome to Lost in the Wasteland, my weekly interview show where I get to learn a little bit more about somebody else's perspective on movies. And joining me is editor, Sif Pop. He is a good friend in real life and online. And uh-huh. it is Mr. Robert Bufard. Thank you, Robert, for coming on for a fourth time on my interview show. A fourth time on the interview show and many, many more on other podcasts and shows as well. I did not check. Yeah. <laughs> I do I do not have actual figures for that one. So there you go. But no. Uh Robert, you're in rare company as we're getting up into this many times on the show. Yeah. Uh so I probably had like well, it's me, my wife, my brother. I don't even know if my brother got up to the fourth one. I've been having scheduling issues. I'm pretty sure Rowan and like Foster and Adam have been on this many times. So mm. you are in rare company. So, but we're here to talk about movies, maybe even a little television this time, because I was having trouble coming up with other movie related <laughs> questions when I came up with this set of questions. So maybe we'll be around five. <laughs> oh no. I got my juices back because I'm halfway through seven. So there we go. Mm. Uh, there will, this is endless. You don't know what you signed up for, Robert. So I'm prepared. There we go. I'll, I'll do this till I'm 85. Well, let's get things started with some very specific favorite related questions that I thought would be interesting to ask people, which is why I'm asking them. But Robert, what's your favorite movie scene? So I was looking through these questions that you sent me ahead of time, Shane, and I was like, you gave me the most impossible question to answer off the off the top. Um, I also thought that I am just going to stay away from Lord of the Rings because that's just the default answer. So I'm the, some of these answers are going to be like my second favorite or maybe top five or something like that. Fair. So like these are just what I was in the mood for as I was going through answering the questions. I put down the Pirates of the Caribbean wheel scene um oh my god that is peak action comedy in such an amazing yeah. way yeah i i love it i rewatched those movies for the first time in a bit last year um and that one in particular jumped up in my estimation is i gave it five stars i think it's great um like you said peak action comedy everything is so perfectly calibrated um you know what everyone wants in that scene. So just like seeing the key pass hands over and over and just like all the other stuff that's tangentially going on with the other pirates and Elizabeth mm-hmm. and and the uh, and the fish people. It's just a great scene and I love it. And the Pirates of the Caribbean movies are some of my favorites. Oh, so good. It was, it was a very specific time growing up when those movies mm-hmm. came out. And I, I think the only one I saw in a theater out of the original trilogy was World's End. I was hmm. 16 at the time, and I'm just like, it was a big deal. It was yeah. a big deal when that yeah. came out. Any others? Any other we're favorite scenes? So we're sticking with that one. Um, yeah. So my number two is from Lord of the Rings. So I definitely have Lord of the Rings up there, too. It's the March of the Ents, because I get goosebumps literally every single time that happens. So... If I was going with the Lord of the Rings answer, uh, it would be the Ride of the Rohirrim. So, uh, a couple similar answers there. Those two tower scenes. There you go. Yeah. Or, well, are you talking about the one at Minas Tirith? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that speech, that music, those chills. As he's yelling, "Death!" Oh man, <laughs> so amazing. Now we have a bit of a yin and yang question here. Maybe they are related, your answers, but we'll find out. Who's your favorite movie <laughs> protagonist? Um, again, I just went with like one of my favorites. So some someone who's like meant a lot to me and that I related to in certain ways over the past few years is Otway from The Grey, uh, Liam Neeson's oh. character. Um, that movie, you know, it was it was memed for being the Liam Neeson punches wolves movie, uh, but it's not like you know, Taken or The Commuter or Walk Along the Tombstones or the other 25 movies that are interchangeable in his filmography. Um, That movie is really emotional, really deep, um, really life-affirming in a 
in a weird way. And that's kind of what I like about it. It's not just like too down the middle, um, cheesy sort of life affirming. It's more realistic life affirming. And that's kind of what I appreciate about it. Oh, I love the gray. I remember seeing that and just being blown away by that so much. And Otway's such a great character. And if you ever need convincing that Liam Neeson is an actually great actor, mm -hmm. uh, which I feel like anybody who's just watched his movies over the past like 15 years might question you um, because all he does is uh, middle-aged to geriatric action movies um, at this point, but like action thrillers, but like that scene where he's like cursing out God, like mm -hmm. that's like amazing. And he is such an interesting character too. There's like this mystic nature about him from like the others uh who crash because like he's so unknowable to them because he's so right. distant yeah. and getting to see those layers pulled back this is also very fitting as we're recording this we have a new liam neeson action thriller coming out this weekend so, do we actually yeah. <laughs> I mean, nobody I, I haven't knows seen one of those in about five years uh this one set in ireland and has Carrie Condon in it as the antagonist. Okay. And I'm like, I'm actually really interested yeah. in this one. <laughs> Except it's getting buried by Kong and Godzilla. So Yeah, yeah. There you go. And who's your favorite movie antagonist? Completely opposite of the spectrum, tonally. I'm gonna say uh Phoenix Buchanan from Paddington 2, the uh the Hugh Grant character. Um that is the right kind of silly for me. Like he <laughs> leans in. I've I've loved this phase of Hugh Grant's career. I love yes. his rom coms, but I I love this phase also. And mm -hmm. he's so silly. I am tickled the deepest shade of shrimp. You know, just that sort of thing. It is. Um, I've I've watched the rain on the roof scene a thousand times where he's dancing at the end of the prison. Gods, lock me up. Oh wait, I already am. And it's just like it's so good. I love him. Oh, he should have been nominated for an Oscar. But, you know, yeah. we all love him anyway. That's the thing. What's crazy is this section of his career started with him playing how many different antagonists and, like, Clown Atlas, including yeah. a cannibal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we just get, I love his work Guy Ritchie right now. Him as Fletch is like, come play with me, Raymond. <laughs> and just like that whole dynamic he has with Charlie Hunnam in that movie is so great. Yeah. And he was great in D D. Like he was a great addition to Dungeons and Dragons. And Wonka. I just love him. Oh, yeah. oh my God. I I feel like I want a sequel just so I can get more of his Oompa Loompa. <laughs> I know. <laughs> like there's a lot of other things I enjoyed about that movie, but like he specifically came here to watch Oompa Loompa Hugh Grant and the, for the five minutes he was in it made me very happy it's really it's... funny that wa watching his press for Dungeons and Dragons and Wonka he could not care less about those movies like he almost despises that he that he's in them but he's great well, in them does. anyway yeah well because he's a professional then he's just yeah. like I have a lot of kids <laughs> and I have I need money I need money. <laughs> oh man. I just love it. And Phoenix Buchanan was such a great antagonist. Mm -hmm. like, Paddington 2 had no business being as great as it was. And it it's peak cinema, just as Nick Cage. Um yeah. from Parable Way to Max Talent. He now knows. Now, what's your favorite movie ending? I will have to go with Moneyball um, as he's riding in the car, listening to the song from his daughter uh, mm -hmm. that she finally recorded to him as she sang, you're such a loser dad in a loving way. Of course. Um, I, I just love how that movie ties everything together because yes, Miguel Tejada and Barry Zito and <laughs> all these guys were on the A's in the movie. doesn't even mention yeah. them, but the movie is more about this character of Billy Bean yeah. and his his journey to realizing what success actually is and it's for him it's not necessarily you know getting the biggest paycheck it's trying to do the best with what he has 
and of course staying near his family and especially his daughter. So that that scene bringing it all together after he turned down the Red Sox job, um, yeah, it it gets me every time. I watch it, you know, during spring training um, every year, and I, I watched it a couple of weeks ago, and yeah, I was choking up during the end like I do every year. Does it hurt you at the end that he's just like, no, sorry, Red Sox? <laughs> uh, like as a Red Sox fan? No, because yeah. they won the World Series the next year. <laughs> oh, it's it's such a fitting film. And that's the thing. It's it's about the money ball. It's about him. It's about his process. So like, sure. Like the only real player we got highlighted was Scott Hatterberg. It was Chris Pratt. Yeah. <laughs> of all people. But like, that's not what it was about. And it's still extremely effective in what it does. And I am very shocked you didn't pick any of the endings from Return of the King. Um, but I'll let that go. <laughs> Just kidding. For my I fourth interview, well, answer. I'm back. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Joke's on you. We're going to have just as many endings to this show today. <laughs> <laughs> That's how many questions you have to ask me. So uh, Now, what's a film that you wish that you could watch in a theater for the first time? Now, this could be a film that you missed when it was in a theater, or it could be like you weren't even born yet. And like you wish that like your first experience watching this film could have been in a theater. I'm gonna break my own rule and I'm gonna say Lord of the Rings Fellowship of the Ring. Okay. Um because I was five years old when it came out, uh not quite old enough to fully go and see it, or at least my parents wouldn't let me go and see it yet. Yeah. Um so if I if I was, you know, twenty something in two thousand and one and I had gone to see that movie, like you think I'm insufferable with Lord of the Rings now? I'll just like imagine what I would have been then. So I I I've seen the movies a thousand times now, and I watched them uh, at home for the first time. So the fact that I was transported, having watched them at home for the first time, is one thing. I just I wonder what it would have been like to be there to see the Shire music and the and all that, you know, for the first time on the big screen when no one has seen it yet, and here's everyone's introduction to it. Well, it was a special, a special moment because I was ten when that and Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone came out the same month. What, what a whirlwind of fantasy! But mm -hmm. my experience, unfortunately, was only saw two thirds of a Fellowship in theaters because my aunt didn't check the runtime beforehand, and we had to leave right after Frodo <laughs> got stabbed by the cave troll. So you thought I, he was dead. <laughs> I did, and then I showed up to school on Monday, and my classmate told me a giant fire demon showed up, and I'm like, "What? <laughs> Just that whole that's the bell that's rock the and part. everything." But no, I definitely re remember my experiencing Two Towers and Return of the King in a theater, mm. sitting next to my mom when the Battle of Helm's Deep started, and just being like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> Eleven year old Shane's mind blown. So they it definitely was a special experience. Now, Robert, what's a subject matter that you would love to see get a documentary treatment? Uh, there's a book called Homegrown written by a Red Sox beat writer. Um, he chronicles from when like Mookie Betts, Xander Bogards, Jackie Bradley, Andrew Benintendi, all those guys are coming up through the minors and like, 2012 um all the way to when the homegrown team won the world series in 2018 um and i would like to see like a not prified documentary of that because they're they're like world series movies yeah. made by you know the red sox network yeah. which is fine and i like it because i just like experiencing everything that happened but like just to get a more objective last dance type of thing where it's like, here's everything that went down. Here's how they made all these decisions. Um, I, I just want more sports documentaries in general and That's stuff fair. that shows, like, honestly, what, what goes on. All the Ken Burns. Just yeah. Get over here and start making this movie. Um, we could get Mookie Betts to be the MJ of the situation, just sitting there in his chair. 
uh, <laughs> commentating and stuff like that. Um, they they traded the me, s- and I took that personally. <laughs> and now he's a Dodger, and yeah, yeah. and by shortstop. <laughs> Interesting. Which is something. Oh, I I hate to see the like I call them Marlins moments. Where it's like mm. you won, and then you blew it up, and just let it all go. Marlins did it twice on That's purpose. Like, yeah, on purpose. That's what the Marlins do. But like, I not even a Red Sox fan, but like I felt bad that like a Red Sox fan is just like everybody jumping ship, and I'm like, I know the feeling. Seeing it, yeah. apparently the Dimebacks can only afford to pay Zach Greinke. That's basically it. Uh, I I will always remember when Paul Goldschmidt got traded. Mm. Just tore my heart out. But small market team, that's that's what I get. And that's the weirdest thing. The Red Sox are a small market team. That's what's frustrating about it. Yeah, You have money. Why are you spending it? And especially in that division, too. But no, I, I, I would watch that documentary. Well, yeah. to be fair, I watch most baseball documentaries. So <laughs> maybe, except not as one about the Dodgers. I don't know if I could sit through it. Let's um, see what's actually going on with Otani. I would I would watch that. <laughs> well, if they find out he bet on baseball and... They, I hope he didn't, but I, I'm curious. If they don't ban him... So rip out if it's if it turns out that he actually bet on baseball and they don't ban him, I'm gonna be so mad. And now they just yeah. gave excuses for Pete Rose to just be like, I wish I had a, <laughs> had a translator. It's like did, oh you, did you see the video? There was a video of Pete Rose like actually saying that. <laughs> yeah. Like I wasn't being facetious, he literally yeah, said it's, it's so crazy. like oh my god. Well, now for something a little bit different. Mm-hmm. Heading over to the world of television, what's your favorite television show? Right now, I'm honestly going to say New Girl. Um, I'm I'm the type of person who rewatches sitcoms over and over and over, um, and that's one that I never get tired of, and I don't think it has any bad seasons. So, like, Modern Family is another one that's up there for me, but I think it kind of loses something once the kids get to a certain age and the writers try to figure out how to you know, they had a thing going when they're all young, but they don't really know how to deal with teenagers and young adults yeah. anymore. Um, but New Girl, it like hits his stride almost right from the beginning and carries it all the way through season six or seven, whichever one's the last. Um, I, I have a lot of good memories watching it with people close to my life. Uh, I quote it all the time. I still rewatch it. Uh, I think Zoe Deschanel has never been better than she is on that show. Like mm-hmm. that's about as perfect as, as she can be. Um Jake Johnson as Nick is one of my favorite characters in anything ever. Uh, I named my cat Winston after Winston from New Girl. So it's just like, I, I, I love that show. And it's probably my favorite. You're the second person who strongly talked about the show to me relatively oh, yeah? recently. And Jeff from Sip Pop also is a mm. big New Girl fan. Um, I feel like, well... There's too many new things that I have to finish watching and catching up with. But, like, when I get around to, like, binging something older, that's definitely gone up my list. I remember it being on. Like, I remember when it was running on television. Like, I would see ads for it all the time. I just never watched it and never never made it into my, like, cycle of television shows. But definitely have heard nothing but great things. So I'll have to check it out at some point. Yeah. Now... What's your favorite television finale? Well, we talked about it on this uh, this very YouTube channel, and it's Succession. There you um, go. That's also very close to being my favorite show of all time. I think I've seen it three times all the way through now. Did he jump? Um, <laughs> did he jump in? <laughs> I would not be surprised if he did shortly after it cut. Uh, I just... It's impossible with all the theories... Um, you know, the last HBO show where everyone's theorizing about how the final season is going to go was an absolute train wreck disaster in Game of Thrones. Um, and then Succession comes and, and fully sticks the landing. And if people want to hear more of my thoughts, go find that video <laughs> from this past summer on your on your you channel. Check out that episode of Wasteland Talks, where we discuss Succession's last season. Just 
that that was such an emotional week with that oh, ending, big. Barry ending, Ted Lasso ending, um, and Marvel's Mrs. Maisel. They all ended in a week. And I'm in the I'm in the Marvel's Mrs. Maisel camp where I'm like, that was my favorite. But mm-hmm. like, well, that succession finale was exactly what it needed to be. And turn me out this boy is <laughs> never gonna get old. No, yeah. Never. Never. And oh my god, and how it all shook out. I'm just like, this is how it had to be, right? The most nihilistic worst possible way for this to end for most of them. Yeah. Uh <laughs> I think Tom wound up fine. <laughs> but for how long? Just like Kendall, who knows how long it'll last for him. So, oh my god, what it was such a crazy finale. And when I saw that it was gonna be an hour and a half, I'm like, oh they're going all in. Yeah. And like only HBO can get away with. <laughs> Every other just like, why is this episode so damn long? <laughs> and it just like HBO's like, oh, it's a finale. <laughs> We're gonna watch this for 90 minutes. Uh that's what HBO gets. Uh doesn't Stranger me. Things have like two hour episodes or something? <laughs> that was one of the shows where I'm like, why is this episode two hours? Uh it could have just been like tighter. Yeah. <laughs> Like, I don't I even watch like, it anymore. I just heard that the episodes were so long, and I'm like, I'm glad I'm not even invested. Part of the like, part of the positive about television is like you can like slip an episode in. Yeah, like you can like I don't have time for a movie, but like I can watch an episode of a show. Yeah, when it's two hours, you can plan for that. And like I watch that show with my wife. I'm like, we don't plan for that. <laughs> Like we I both need watch- to be free. Yeah, I was just watching um a murder at the end of the world. Mm-hmm. I just watched that mini series, the seven episodes of FX. One of the episodes was an hour and 20 minutes. I'm like, what are you doing? Why is this an hour and 20 minutes? And then the next two episodes are 42. And I'm like, mm-hmm. just randomly out of nowhere for no reason. <laughs> and that and that was the like the it was, that was the fifth episode in the last two episodes of 40 something minutes. And I'm like, what? It's so random. Where's your logic? Uh it's it's anyway. Succession, great 90 minutes. <laughs> I, I even went to a watch party. Like I don't oh, yeah. even I never do that. Like I haven't done that stuff for TV since literally Game of Thrones. So mm-hmm. like that was the first time I ever went to somebody's house to watch a show. So that's the impact that it had. Now, Robert, we're going to make a film about your life. Who should direct it? Um, can I give you two options? Sure. All right. The first one is going to be Martin Scorsese, but specifically in the mid 80s as he's making After Hours. Because there you go. Uh, sometimes I feel like my life is After Hours where it's just like, Here's a lot of crap being thrown at you, and you're just like <laughs> going through, not knowing what's going on. But at the end of the day, you re- return to some form of normalcy, um, and you know what? It's reassuring in in a certain sense that uh, I'll always return to some sort of normalcy, even with the wacky things that happen. Um, so and in that vein, what was that? And how you and how you literally get there? Exactly. Yeah. How yeah. you get home? <laughs> And in that similar vein, I would uh, uh, say the Cohen brothers, but specifically the version of them who directed a serious man or inside Lewin Davis, where it's still just like, what is going on? We're being repetitive. It's it's that sort of thing. Is Oscar Isaac going to play you? Uh, the cat is going to play me. Perfect. Love it. Uh-huh. No notes. Uh, eh. I Scorsese was one of my thoughts for this one too, purely from I feel seen. Uh yeah. from like I could capture the Italian Americanness of my upbringing and existence, to be honest. And it's just like <laughs> there we go. But Ray Romano, after I watched Somewhere in Queens, I really enjoyed that movie a lot. And 
I'm like, he gets it too. <laughs> Pizons all around. Now, my uh, last question for you, Robert, is what are five films you would recommend to people that were made before you were born? Do you want me to go one at a time or just list them all out? Do you go one at a time is fine. Uh, number one is one that I watched very recently for the first time, and that's Lawrence of Arabia, which I was just absolutely nice. blown away by. Looks amazing. Mm -hmm. um, has so much going on thematically. Has such great acting from Peter O'Toole. Like, there's a close-up of him uh, on the train after, a, after like, the crash um, mm -hmm. or when it stopped or whatever. And as the guy's pointing the gun at him, he just has this really subtle but, like, jarring facial expression he's so good mm -hmm. um another one that i watched for the first time recently is 400 blows um oh nice which is i don't know like let's be better to our kids you know <laughs> like that's basically all that it comes down to uh, this kid's existence have been better um, a lot of things could have happened yeah um Absolutely. paris texas which is I've only seen that at one time, but it's absolutely mesmerizing to me. Um, it's like it's about two and a half hours long and like not a lot happens. But for some reason, I just can't look away. Uh, yeah, and of Vin course, Vendors. the shot. Yeah, Vim Vendors. I still haven't seen Perfect Days. I really want to. Um, but the shot where they're looking at it or talking through the glass and it has that reflection uh, may just be the best film shot of all time. I don't know. Maybe. Um, it's really impressive. I would also say The Graduate, because I, I love The Graduate. It's great. It's really funny, but also speaks some truths uh, about life. And I'll go with a, a mostly fun one to end and just say Rocky. Rocky's a great one. Uh, you can't go wrong with the original Rocky. And the, that Robert and I kind of sandwich Philadelphia um, yeah. in our existence. It's hard not to rocky there but those are all some great picks a couple of them i talked about on my movie club with my friends including 400 blows and um i literally just blanked on what the one you said uh paris texas and the graduate the graduate the graduate was actually one we did a while ago but like I, the graduate is such such a 60s movie like such a late 60s movie Mm -hmm. that it's like it's that new hollywood kind of feel to it and what is crazy is that dustin hoffman almost wasn't in it because he was already doing another film at the time and had to quit and that film was the producers i didn't actually know that he was supposed to be leo bloom hmm. and then he got this audition for the graduate asked mel brooks if he wouldn't hate him if he like quit and went to go to the graduate to then have an on-screen affair with Mel Brooks's wife <laughs> and Bancroft. So, and Anne Bancroft is a, was a gorgeous woman. Hard to say no. And all of you who think that had a happy ending, right? Yeah, chew on that a little bit more. <laughs> go rewatch it like Fight Club. Yeah, just like that. Just, that's just one of those endings where it's just like, what did we do? What have we done? And it's so impactful. But also, Lawrence of Arabia is, that's one of those kinds of films where it's like, oh, that's one of the greatest films of all time. And then you do watch it and you're just like, yeah. Yeah, it, is. it really yeah. is. <laughs> and it has two amazing shots that I love so much is that edit of the mm -hmm. match. To the desert, you're just like, that's what editing's about. That's like on par with Bone into Spaceship right. from 2001 A Space Odyssey. And then that shot of Omar Sharif just slowly coming into frame, coming towards the camera. I'm like, the, the courage of a filmmaker like David Lean to be like, yeah. You're going to sit there and you're going to watch this and it's going to be compelling and you're mm -hmm. not going to complain about it. And it just works that way. 
Bridge on the River Kwai is probably my favorite of his, but like Lawrence of Arabia is an all time classic. And the fact that Peter O'Toole went 0 for 9 in his best actor uh, attempts to actually win an Oscar. So next time you're being like, well, I'd leave you have to wait so long. There's some of the most yeah. impressive actors of all time who never won one. Peter O'Toole was one of them, but he <laughs> did at least get to play uh, Anton Ego. <laughs> That was such a good performance. And that's why you get it, uh, Peter O'Toole. But yeah. that was my last question for you, Robert. So how we like to wrap up the show is you get to ask me a question. And I was just joking. I'm not going to make you ask me like eight questions. Um, but, <laughs> but what would you like to ask the Wasteland reviewer? Well, I really did have a perfect question that came to my mind the other day. And I just never wrote it down. So I don't have it maybe on round five, six, seven, eight, something like that. I'll, I'll, it'll come back to me and I'll ask you. <laughs> but for now, I'll say, not counting Lord of the Rings or Mad Max, what is your favorite third film in a franchise? I What's funny is I was literally just looking at my letterbox top 500 prepping mm -hmm. for Rowan and the Wasteland because we were talking about sequels. And mm -hmm. I guess... Oh, what's actually funny is I wouldn't even pick Mad Max for my okay. number three, three. Cause like, no offense, Thunderdome, but like you're a little two eighties for me. Uh but like I would probably have to pick Captain America Civil War. Oh, That's yeah. really like still that. my favorite Marvel MCU movie. And I love every bit about it. I like that it's considerably more complex and gray than the vast majority of the MCU movies. Like, you actually have to make a decision on, like, do you support Cap? And it's a, it's not even just on one issue. It's do you support on, like, the political issue? Or do you support on the personal issue? Because, like, you could support Cap in the idea that you don't believe in this registration. You don't think you don't trust government bodies to tell the Avengers what to do, but do you support cap on the fact that like, he's putting his friendship of Bucky ahead of a lot of other things in this situation is Tony's motivations out of guilt and not really believing in what mm -hmm. he's supporting in this situation. And like, you actually have to contemplate those things and what I appreciated, like, it didn't end on the airport big comic booky fight. It was a very violent and passionate fight between two men that, like, really respected each other at one point and also at one point didn't respect each other and all that boiling to the surface. And I appreciate Zemo a lot as an antagonist because he isn't like most Marvel villains. He was just, you know, pushing buttons and mm. he hit the right ones. And like you get Black Panther introduced, you get Spider-Man introduced, and then you still get the airport sequence. But I really love the character work. And when it really comes down to it, it is still technically a Captain America film because he's the catalyst for all the conflict in it and the choices that he makes in conflict with the other Avengers. And it's just every time I watch it, it still hits. The only things that I wish were better, like, Russo still aren't great about hand-to-hand -hand combat kind of stuff like that. And it's like all this super choppy yeah. editing stuff in, like, the uh -huh. opening sequence of it. And, you know, it still doesn't look great in terms of, like, a cinematography standpoint. Airport still looks like a really bland, it's like, German airport. <laughs> it's just gray everywhere. But, like... Yeah. It's something that really hits for me, and I love the progression of what where Cap went, because the Steve Rogers at the end of Civil War is a very different place than Steve Rogers was at the beginning of the first Avenger, and I am still super into Steve Rogers being my favorite MCU character, and that made me tear up when he finally got his dance. I'm just going to mm. say that. So yes, my num my favorite number three film outside of Return of the King, um, uh -huh. is Captain America: Civil War. Nice. But thank you for your question, Robert. Sure. And thank 
you again for coming on. Uh, would you like to shamelessly plug anything before we wrap up? Because we love shameless plugs on here. Oh, yeah. Uh, let's plug Sithpop.com. Um, mm -hmm. All the good writing that goes on there from lots of other people, <laughs> including <laughs> the two people on the screen right now. Um, and the Also See podcast, which I do with our buddy Foster every week where we take it. I have, I have this member as we take an actor or director from an upcoming release and talk about one of their other movies that might not be as well known. Uh, bite-sized episodes. We have some fun. We do a grid, and then we move on. Um, and just how I like it, at, at least for recording. Um, so yeah, it's fun. Except when I showed up, and it was like a fifty-minute episode. Um, with Barton Fink. Um, we won't say what happened to Barton Fink's name no, in your most no. recent episode, but it's all good. But thank all of you out there for always tuning in and supporting your Wasteland reviewer.